The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Ryan, thank you for taking some time to join me and join us on the podcast. Thanks for having me today. So we're recording this as part of the ASA's Virtual Investor Summit, um, which promises to have many great conversations about investing, about finding value in unusual places or in places that are in plain sight. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about quality investing and how you do that at Magellan. We're going to walk through your process, but maybe just to get the ball rolling, let's talk a little bit about yourself. How did you get into investing and how did you come to be at Magellan? Certainly. So uh, I don't have the, or I didn't follow the traditional path, I guess, in, into finance. I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do at university. I started off studying physio. Um, then I saw a lot more appeal in some of my friends that were studying engineering, the logic of it, um, the math of it. And so I switched to that. That's, that's the course I did. Um, and I worked for several years as an engineer. Now, during that time, I was interested in investing. Um, I think even at high school, I remember going to an ASX event that my mum took me down to. And as part of my uh, engineering degree, I did some electives in investment management and real estate investing and um, some early stage corporate finance and things like that. But I I didn't have, um, you know, the understanding of the professional roles that existed um, within investing. And so as I continued as an engineer, I kept looking into that, uh, learning more about it, reading more books. Um, obviously, a lot of um, Warren Buffett, I'm sure you've <laughs> heard people <laughs> reference before, Seth Klarman. I think also the GFC was also uh, a real significant influence on, on my decision to get into finance. It was, it was a challenging period, but it was also a very fascinating um, period to try and understand and unpick what was going on. And there's a lot of books written about it, obviously. So I found reading um, the materials on that quite fascinating. And so after, uh, I think, two or three years working as an engineer, I decided I, I wanted to make the switch. Um, and and to do that, I enrolled in a Master's of, of Finance at the University of Queensland. And I also enrolled in, in the CFA. Hmm. Um, and I think I'd completed Level 1 CFA at the time. You know, it's a much more cost-efficient way, I would say, than uh, than the master's course in terms of learning what is important um, for investing. And, and I think actually the level one is, is probably helpful for almost everybody to to kind of read the materials. Um, and so, so I'd enrolled in those, and, and fortunately Magellan was starting up, and so I was I was interviewed for that role and was fortunate enough to to get that position. Um, and so that was. Yeah, as I said, I was, felt really lucky to to get that role interviewed with with Chris Mackay, with Gerald Stack, um, and it was a really interesting time to to join the industry mm. um, as well. You know, it seems a long time ago now, but from the macro perspective, we we're in the midst of the eurozone crisis. Would Europe break up? All these sort of um, things that I hadn't had as much exposure to, and, and then you're listening to really intelligent people speak about them and the analysis they're getting done was very interesting. So. It, really opened my eyes to the professional side of, of investing, it really opened my eyes to what deep analysis meant um, and what business quality meant. And I think 
one of the things that still stand, sticks with me today was one of the investment cases um, they had at the time, and it was a significant part of the portfolio, the Magellan portfolio at the time, was investments in Home Depot and Lowe's. So obviously the GFC had a very depressing effect on, on housing and, and housing starts in the US. Um, and the investment thesis at the time was, was quite straightforward, um, but effectively US new housing starts in the US are currently around 800, 900,000 a year. And if you looked historically, and if you looked at what supply and demand and population growth implied, they should have been around one and a half million. Um, and often markets will look through cycles and, and they will assume that that will come because the GSC had been so significant and had you know, had this depressing effect for multiple years, people had stopped to that usual level. And so you could get a business that was trading as if it was on mid-cycle earnings when really housing starts, which obviously drive a lot of activity at Home Depot and those like they would at Bunnings, depressed levels. And then you could do the analysis on what would that do for revenue mm -hmm. as they improved? What would that do for margins because of the operating le leverage that you get through those stores? They were still very profitable. So they were buying back a lot of their shares at a very attractive price. And so for me, having read about all these things and then and then coming in and seeing this investment case and the work being done, um, it, it was really resonated with me and was consistent with what I'd read. And so that was a really kind of exciting entry uh, into investing. Can you, Brian, maybe now just tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, your role today then, because uh, that was then, what is now? I'm curious how you spend your time, what you focus on day to day, and like, like honestly, like what goes into an average day for you now? Yeah, absolutely. So maybe just to, I guess, bridge bridge from where, where I finished before and, and where I am now. Uh, I did start in the franchises team. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to move to the US. We had a US office for several years. Um, and as part of that, um, started up the industrials team with, with Chris Weldon. And then as that was folded into another team, um, joined the technology team. So I've, I've been across a few different teams um, and my current role is uh, portfolio manager and head of financials and, and technology. Um, and there's, there's three, I guess, separate roles within that role. Um, there's the analyst component, there's the sector head component, and then there's the PM component. Um, and so I might just talk through each mm. of those and, and what I view as uh, what I'm trying to do in that role. So starting with the analyst role, this is still my primary um, role. It's what I spend 70% uh, of my time doing. And it's probably what I, you know, if I'm prioritizing that something, this is what I'm prioritizing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what that entails is being responsible for covering 10 to 15 um, approved companies and we tend to group them in a few different subsectors. So I look at communications infrastructure, some digital advertising. Um, I look at media, uh, which includes video and audio. And so covering those companies, that's maintaining financial models, making forecasts. It's reviewing results. We're currently in earnings season, so that's about to start. Uh, it's attending industry conferences, whether those are put on by the financial community or their trade conferences and talking to industry experts just to really try and dig in to understand what's happening within those industries, um, what's changing, testing your investment thesis, testing your thesis um, around quality. Mm. And, you know, that list isn't static, that 10 to 15 names, there's a certain amount of churn that occurs as companies are acquired, as views on qualities change, as new companies come to market. Um, so as part of bringing the companies onto that list, we'll do a pretty lengthy initiation report where we're trying to understand uh, and score, which we can talk about later, you know, things on quality metric, risk metrics, make sure that this is a company that really fits within our universe and it's a company that we understand in sufficient depth that we're comfortable putting clients' monies in it at the end of the day. Mm. Um, and so once we, once we have that list, of course, that's all targeted at um, assessing others' attractive investment opportunities at the current price and should they be considered for a position in the portfolio. Um, mm. And so across the team, we have an approved list of around 100 to 150 high-quality companies. 
Um, they're obviously split across different sectors, which are attractive at different times uh, of the cycle. And that's you know, significantly more than the 25 or 30 companies we might have in the portfolio. And the idea is that we want to remain um, highly knowledgeable about these companies so that if there's a dislocation in the market, if something happens, if management drops a ball, uh, we're ready um, to act. Uh, we have the confidence and the conviction to act. So that's, that's the first role. Um, the second part is the sector head role. Um, so this is more of a coordination um, and some element um, process elements as well. So within um, my team, the financials and technology team, it's around six or seven people. And we need to decide what companies do we want to cover? Um, how are we going to resource that? We might be coordinating how we're thinking about what impact COVID will have on our coverage universe, what impact AI might have on our coverage universe. Are there common learnings that we want to draw out that we want to share with the PMs and, and present that to the PMs? So that's an important part of that. And, and the other second part of that sector head role, I would say, is, is making sure there's a lot of inter-team engagement. Um, so a large part of our job, we're probably sitting, you know, we're reading these reports, mm. these transcripts. It's, it's a bit of an individual um, activity. But we also, the really interesting part is discussing it with people, debating, you know, what's going to happen, sure. which, which side of the fence are you on? And so I view part of that role as, you know, trying to make sure I'm, I'm reading what they're looking at, reading their work and engaging with them. Um, as I mentioned, maybe there's 20 to five, 25 to 30 companies in the portfolio, but we're looking at 100 to 150. So let's also make sure we're having discussions around those you know, 100 companies that aren't in the portfolio, um, you know, and have, having a fun time discussing them. Mm. Um, and then the final part is is the PM component. We we have the lead PMs, uh, Nikki Thomas and, and Arvid, on the Global Fund. In addition to that Global Fund, Magellan has some institutional mandates um, that we're managing fairly large sums for a relatively small number of clients. Alan Pullen is one of the lead yeah. PMs uh, for some of those portfolios. And, and Hannah, uh, my colleague Hannah Dickinson and I help Alan um, with that. You know, we get exposure to his thought process on portfolio construction and you know, he's been doing it for a long time. So, you know, it's an opportunity for us to, to learn from him um, and establish our own process and then obviously try to offer our own views um, as mm. well. How, as the sector lead, how often would you meet up with the, the broader group of analysts? Yeah, I think the the exact form of interaction changes over time depending on kind of what's working. But, you know, we sit in a pod in the office. Right. Um, and so I'd say a lot of the discussion is, you know, you know, you know if a result came out. We share that information. We post it on a blog. And then it's me reading that, me asking them questions about it. Um, doing that. So mm. we probably have structured interactions maybe fortnightly. Um, and then we sit down with the, the PMs as a, as a team probably monthly on a structured basis, but it's also a lot of the ad hoc discussions um, yeah. Yeah. that come out um, as well. I've got one final personal question, then we can move on. Do you find yourself, um, when you're doing your analyst work, do you find yourself, um, like do you need like an environment that's conducive to that? So like at home you might like have the, have no music on, you just focus on reading. Like, is there anything that works for Ryan more so than other things, like when it comes to diving deep into companies? Uh, yeah, look, I'm fortunate in that when I listen to music, I don't really hear words, um, which, <laughs> which means that I don't know the words to any songs, but it means that I can put on headphones and use that to block out the noise and distraction around me without yeah. actually getting distracted by the the music yeah. itself so that's my approach if if there's a reporting uh, companies reported or there's an investor day or something i'm trying to get through i find that a good way to to block out the noise it also mm. kind of sends a signal to, to other people <laughs> not to maybe um approach you during that period yeah i do think writing is a little bit different when you get to the writing phase of a report i think yeah at, at home is probably better um because mm. even then the music can be a little bit distracting if you're trying to do long longer form writing i've just like, we've all seen those 
Hollywood movies where there's like some heavy metal playing in the background while people are thinking or something like this. Um, but uh, I could definitely am one that couldn't do that. I need like the quiet space and the focus. Um, can you talk a little bit about the investment philosophy at a high level? Because obviously that then informs the process that you follow day to day. So mm-hmm. maybe if we start there, how do you describe the Magellan investment philosophy and even indeed your own as well, perhaps? Uh, and then we'll just drill down. Yeah. So look, I, I think as you kind of alluding to, there's lots of ways to, to make money and there's lots of ways to lose money. So I do think it's really mm. important to identify what's your own philosophy, um, how do you intend to deliver good returns and then be disciplined in executing that approach. And as you said, that you know everyone has nuances on, so you won't talk to two quality or value managers. So I think everybody has nuances as well. Mm. Um, but the approach at Magellan is, is to invest in very high quality businesses, um, businesses that we think have sustainable growth power wins, and then to try and acquire those interests in those businesses at discounts to what we think are fair value. And I don't want to, you know, I think all three of those matter. Um, so I don't think you can overweight in one in, in isolation. Uh, I think it's important uh, to focus on all three. And, you know, if we start with quality, uh, you know, it's a pretty broad, somewhat intangible term, but we, mm. we're defining it as companies that we think can earn attractive returns on capital. It doesn't need to be stratospheric. Um, and we think the earnings are sustainable. Um, so, you know, there might be a lot of services companies out there, for example, ones that I might have invested in in my early days in Australia. The returns look amazing because there's no capital required, but they're not durable businesses. So it's both the the returns that they're generating being, let's call it 15 to 20% plus, so well above the cost of capital, but also durable, what means they're not going to get disrupted by competition, by macro shocks, by external factors um, like COVID. And so... As part of our process I alluded to or spoke to before about doing those initiation reports. And so we'll um, complete those. They might be 20, 30 pages, something like that. And that's really to understand the company and make sure we're doing the due diligence, but then also to to rank them based on what we call economic moat, um, which is the, the competitive advantage side, business risk, which I'd call predictability of the earnings um, or other things that might be tail cases, but could have a very detrimental impact, um, and agency risk. So what is management going to do with the cash flows of the business? Are they going to act in our interests or are they going to um, you know, empire build and acquire lots of businesses and destroy value that way? So that's how we define quality. That's how um, you know we implement it in our process. And we review those scores as well every six months. Mm. Um, and I think quality matters for a few reasons. First, if if a company isn't generating returns above its cost of capital, uh, it's not creating any value. Um, they're much better off just returning the cash to shareholders, even if it's growing, it's, there's no value in that growth. So I think that's a big one. Um, and second is the value you know, is of a business is based on the future cash flows. Um, and so if we want to have conviction in our valuations and we want to say this company looks cheaper, this company looks more expensive. Um, We want to have a reasonable level of certainty around those future cash flows. And I think that goes to business Mm. quality as well. If if you've got lots of companies with really wide ranges of outcome, it's going to be difficult to assess which ones are actually good value um, at the current price versus the other ones. I think another um, maybe less obvious benefit of why quality matters is what I think of as the sleep easy test. Um, Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, what's in the portfolio does matter a lot for for investors. But what also matters is whether you stay invested during tough periods. For sure. Or if, you know, if during the GFC or other periods you you exit the market, um, that can be very expensive. Um, And so I think having a quality portfolio uh, with names that you're familiar with, you know these are very resilient, stable businesses that are going to be there um, in, in 10, 20 plus years. I think it makes investors less likely to to make mistakes in terms of changing their asset allocation when they shouldn't do. So it might not show up in the fund manager's stated returns, but it will show up um, mm. on the investor's um, wealth creation through mm. periods. I think the other... Um, 
part of quality that's really important to keep in mind is it needs to be forward looking as well. So, you know, I think it's really interesting to understand company histories, to look at historical returns. It's an important way to inform what might happen in the future, but markets are always forward looking. Um, and if there's perceived cracks in quality, that can get priced in quite quickly. So, you know, the valuable part of what we're doing is trying to understand where's, you know, where's the game going, not not where it's been. Um, mm. And so to emphasize that within our process, one of the other scores we have is moat trend. So, you know, there's a constant debate internally. Uh, what do we put in moat trend versus what do we put in moat? And in a way, it doesn't really matter. Um, because the point of having the moat trend is just always to remind us that we need to be forward looking. Uh, we shouldn't be overweighting what has happened. We really need to be mm. understanding and constantly testing what, what might happen. Um, because, you know, moats, as much as we think they, you know, are very secure, there's examples where we've seen, you know, blue chip, what you'd think of very high quality companies had those moats erode. If we think of something like IBM and and Microsoft, you know, obviously IBM was the blue chip of the 80s and it's just kind of slid into much less relevance versus a Microsoft. If you think of something like Intel, you know, the chip manufacturing leadership position for, for decades but has slowly ceded that position to, to TSMC. You think of eBay and its first mover advantage in e-commerce um, and then Amazon just kind of dwarfing it and, and relegating it to selling more kind of collectibles and secondary mm. goods and that sort of thing. So I think it's really important to to look forward there. What, um, Ryan, if I might just jump in real quickly, what are the types of things that you would put in moat trend then? Because uh, you mentioned like the difference between that and like the moat is it like a source of internal debate. What are the types of things you might put in there? Would it be a qualitative view on the market, like in the industry? or R&D budget? Like, how do you think about that? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, there, there is a, inevitably a lot of overlap with Moat, but what we're trying to pick out is are there emerging threats that might be pretty early right. stage? We think it's probably a low probability that they're going to be disruptive to the existing business, but we want to put it there. We want to explore it. Um, and we want to keep exploring it. So if you think of something, um, we'll, we'll go and talk about chips a little bit, but um, you know, NVIDIA has this wonderful leadership position in GPUs today, uh, but the, the data set of companies aren't particularly happy that they've got an effective monopoly on leading edge GPUs. And so they're interested in trying to develop competitive in alternatives, whether that's developing their own or that's them supporting um, earlier stage chip developers. And so there's a few companies that are doing that. And so we want to understand, you know, where what are the capabilities of those companies? What would it take for them to be successful and potentially eat mm -hmm. into NVIDIA's um, advantage there? So obviously that could be part of Moat itself, but I think those potentially disruptive forces are something that fit better within Moat trend or at least prompt you to, to make sure you're staying on top of it. Like you said, it's the kind of the tr the trend part is the important bit, right? Like that's where it just forces you to think about it. Um, so sustainable growth and and competitive advantage, um, like qual through quality lens as well. Um, you mentioned valuation before. How is that kind of third point of the triangle put together? Yeah, so I might just just quickly on on the growth part. Um, the reason I think growth is is important is there's a minimum level that I think is healthy for companies. Right. It doesn't need to be, you know, ten percent per annum, but I think a little bit ahead of GDP, maybe one two percent ahead of GDP, mm -hmm. and it's a bit of an intangible benefit in that one. It just it creates natural leverage in the business if you're growing a little bit. That makes it easier for management um, to to manage the business, and also creates opportunities for people in the business. And that makes it easier to manage the people. It makes you know, the culture more positive. You know, if you have a business that's constantly needing to cut headcount, close factories, it's just a challenging environment. So I think it's just easier uh, to manage and less prone to, to mistakes with that little bit of healthy growth in there. On, on the valuation side, look, I think for me, this is the most interesting and, and the most difficult 
of the three. Um, you know, there's the old Buffett adage that price is what you pay and, and value is what you get. I think there he was referring more to, you know, buying low quality companies that appear cheap may not be the, the best mm. idea, but I think it can equally apply to paying too much for quality businesses. You know, I think you always want to leave yourself a margin of safety. Um, and it's difficult because I think quality is a bit intangible. It's not something that you can put into your DCF and, it, you know, spits out a quality company is worth a bit more money. You know, should you pay 10% more for something that's higher quality? Should you pay 20% more for higher quality? Um, you know, those premiums are probably a little bit cyclical as well. So it's, it's difficult. Um, but I think a key execution risk for quality investors like ourselves is um, that if you're buying companies that are consensus high quality at higher multiples, um, and then you're potentially selling those companies if concerns have arisen around that quality, um, which, you know, those concerns might be real, they might be perceived, but I, I suspect most companies will go through, you know, questions around their quality being raised. And so if you are going to be responsive to that, you run the risk of kind of buying high um, and selling mm. low, which is obviously not a very good investment strategy. Um, so I think it's, it's important to be disciplined still on what you're willing to pay. You know, there is a price for quality. Um, and always, as we talked about, being forward-looking on business quality because if, if there is a crack or if something uh, causes the market to downgrade their view on the quality of that business, it can occur quite quickly. Mm. Um, and so then if I kind of step back and think about, well, well where might opportunities to buy businesses um, below what they're worth exist within the quality universe. Um, yeah, I would say we're not in the game of trying to predict next quarter's earnings and trade on the basis of that. You probably need to make a lot of bets and you probably need leverage to, to make that work for you. And so we, we leave that um, to the hedge funds. But I think from our perspective, they're probably a bit more longer term investment thesis and opportunities that we're looking to take advantage of and I'll, I'll talk about I think there's six that I can talk through um, sure re in reality it's often a mix it's not just one or the other um, and the best ones are where you get multiple of these kind of working in your favor at once um, so the first two are about inflection points so if you if you have companies that are going through an inflection point in their structural growth outlook, maybe they were growing 5% and there's a change in the tailwinds or the industry or their ability to take share, and they're going to grow 6%, 7%, 8%, even if that doesn't change your earnings dramatically over the next two or three years, maybe it's 2% per annum compounded over three years, so it's only kind of 6 7% um, over a multi-year period, that higher growth will get capitalized very quickly in the earnings multiple um, and re result in an upwards valuation of that business. So if you can anticipate that, understand the industry drivers driving that early, um, that can represent an attractive investment opportunity. An example there might have been something like Adobe um, or other software companies when they were making this transition from licensed software to subscription software, which enabled them to monetize their user base far more efficiently. Mm. and saw growth accelerate meaningfully and, and durable growth um, as well. Similar to that one, you might have an inflection point in, in the quality of the business. Do people view it as higher quality um, than it used to? That could be for a variety of reasons. It could be the mix of the business um, might be shifting, the good part's growing, the, the, the less good part is shrinking. It might be a change in, in how you generate your revenue. I just talked about Adobe going from selling licenses that are quite lumpy to recurring subscription revenue. Investors mm. have a lot more value on that. So here your earnings might not even change. Um, but as the investor, if you're patient and you see this early and you're willing to hold through that period, the value of those earnings will um, be re-rated positively. I think Apple's a good example of that. This was a company that was viewed as a hardware company subject to cycles. Um, and we've seen over the past five years in particular, as that mix of the services revenue um, 
that it generates from its installed base has grown and become mm. a part of the profits, people are willing to pay a lot more for Apple's earnings. Um, and so even though its growth outlook isn't better than it was, let's say, five or, or ten years ago, it's certainly more mature from a, a mm. own perspective, people are willing to pay a lot more for Apple's earnings than they were at that time. Mm. Another kind of two is where the market's made a mistake, I would say, in um, the concerns around near-term earnings power or, or um, business quality. So there's been a piece of news out um, that's made people question the quality of the business. There's been an investment the company's doing or some external... You know, some factor that's caused the earnings to be depressed and people are capitalising that and assuming that is, is permanent. Um, and as I said earlier, we have that bench of companies um, that aren't in the portfolio that we want to stay abreast of because if, if that, those occur and our assessment is that we don't think they're permanent, maybe they last a couple of years, maybe it's shorter, maybe it's a little bit longer, that's an opportunity for us um, to take advantage of that and you know, some of the examples of that might be Microsoft in the early 2010s, there was the emergence of mobile. And people thought that was going to threaten the Microsoft's Office and Windows yeah. desktop franchise. And so you were able to acquire that business at a very attractive price, even whilst it was also transitioning to a software subscription model that was very attractive. I think Netflix is an example of that in, in 2022. It went through a period where um, there was a bit of reopening headwinds, normalization. There were some FX headwinds facing the business. And at the same time, you had had over the past 12 months, you know, Disney launch and Warner launch HBO Max and Apple's launch. And so there was this narrative that competition was driving this softness, um, whereas my view is that it was much more related to this reopening normalization and some saturation of their market as well that they had taken place during COVID. Um, and so people were willing to pay less because of that perceived impact from competition, which you know, we've subsequently seen all of those competitors have to pull back quite sharply in their investments and lift prices because they actually need to make money. <laughs> so um, there's two there. The other one where I would say we tend to um, have a number of investments is just where we are, have conviction that outsized earnings growth will continue for longer than the market might accept, uh, expect. So markets, I think, tend to assume a moderation or a decay rate in, in the growth a company can deliver. Um, and if that doesn't eventuate, then that can lead to you know, attractive returns through time. It does. You probably don't get a big upwards re-rating in the multiple. The earnings don't move, but you know the alt the multiple is stable in that scenario. Oh. They keep growing twelve percent each year, and you get a dividend yield, so you're getting fourteen percent return, which is still a very nice um, return. And some examples of that might be your Mastercard and Visa that have just benefited from the shift to, to digital payments and to credit over the past decade and been able to sustain mid-teens growth for you know, 10, 15 years. And they were never kind of priced at a multiple that reflected that. Um, you could say Alphabet and Facebook or Meta are similar where the size of that digital advertising market just continued to get bigger as they, through innovation and targeting and advertising tools unlocked more and more budget um, for for advertisers and made it more accessible for advertisers. Now, I would say that you know, I pointed to a few examples there. It's a lot easier in hindsight. Um, <laughs> you know, if, if it was that obvious at the time and there weren't reasonable arguments on the other side, the opportunities wouldn't exist or at a minimum they wouldn't be as attractive. Um, so, you know, it's never... It's never, it's, or it's rarely obvious, uh, I think, mm. and it, it does need you to, to do the analysis and to have conviction. Um, mm. But I do think it highlights that, you know, even within pretty well-covered companies, some of the most well-covered companies in the world that we've been talking about, you know, these are just as susceptible to large swings in sentiment as others um, and opportunities still present themselves. Um, mm. And also just, again, the importance of, of being forward-looking and, and being prepared to act if there is um, 
yeah, a, a dislocation in pricing. I just wanted to recap because there were so many good, um, I guess, types of things that you're looking for and examples of like the frameworks you're looking for. So one was a inflection in the structural growth. The next one was uh, an inflection in the, the earnings quality. Um, there's a misjudgment of the business quality altogether. So when businesses are misjudged of how durable perhaps it is, um, a misjudgment in the earnings power, um, and finally, a misjudgment of the duration of earnings growth. So the ability for a company to keep growing, even if the price earnings multiple stays the same. Mm-hmm. I think that if, if people just thought about that, and you gave some great examples of like Netflix and, and the like and Apple through time, I think those are those are some great categories. If someone could sit back and wonder, like, what's my portfolio looking like now? Where does it sit in that? Um, I guess, well, so I guess the, the, the natural part from there is, I mean, I know you've got some examples which you can give to us, but... Um, I guess a lot of people, Ryan, they just might look at like growth as kind of like the only metric, if that makes sense. Like they would look at, so like what's the fastest growing business based on revenue? And mm-hmm. I, do you have any views on that? Like how that might be, I guess, the, the weak spots in that? Yeah, look, um, I mentioned earlier some of the companies that I cover and, and on the subsectors that I cover. And one of those is communications infrastructure. And um, so they're bigger part of the Magellan um, infrastructure funds. Mm -hmm. And I really like covering those very stable, predictable, pretty low growth um, businesses because it it just reminds me that growth isn't everything. Um, You know, growth, Mm -hmm. you've got to be paying the right price um, for that growth. And so I I find it very grounding to to cover those companies but also be looking in the technology and, and kind of fintech space as well at the next um, kind of big big pool. Mm. But I think if we just step back a bit and, and think about growth investing and, and what matters, it's, I think growth investing is, it's a very broad spectrum. Um, so you have everywhere from, let's call it VCs and startups or perhaps speculative growth um, at one end to, to profitable growth at a reasonable price at the other. And Magellan's focus is very much at the, uh, profitable growth at a reasonable price mm. end of the spectrum, and we kind of leave the other end um, to the VC funds and, and the growth funds. You know, part of our promise to clients is to try and deliver double-digit returns um, with downside protection through a portfolio of twenty-five to thirty names that we have high conviction in. And so, it's not—I wouldn't say that's compatible um, mm. with speculative growth. Investing even over a multi-year period, you know, your analysis might be right on the companies, but the returns for speculative growth will be impacted significantly by equity risk premiums, um, by interest rates, things that aren't really within your control. Um, and we saw this during COVID when speculative growth had a massive rally on on lower rates, you know, a lot of retail participation. I would say lower market risk premiums, and then they got hammered. Um, in, in 2022 and you probably you know, prices might have gone from five to 50 and you're not sure you know <laughs> where do you anchor with something like that it um it's quite difficult and i think the structure of managed funds equity funds is probably not that well suited to speculative growth if we think about vc funds they have i think it's important to have that diversification if you're investing in early growth the failure rate is very high. So, you know, the VC model might be that our one or two winners out of 30 are going to pay for the other 28 or 29 losers. Um, that's pretty difficult to do within, you know, a, an equity fund structure. Um, mm-hmm. They also are, can let their winners run a lot more. So whereas we'll have portfolio controls, that mean the max position size might get to 7%. Um if you're running a VC fund and that one company that you know, strikes gold and is very successful, that might end up being effectively 80% of mm. that portfolio. But we would have been forced to, to trim that along the way. So you can't let your winners run in the same way. They can also probably a bit more tax efficient. They could distribute that stock to their investors at the end of the, the period as well. Whereas because of that position size limit, we would be needing to to kind of sell along the way. Yeah. Um, 
I also think it's probably even got harder for managers like us to invest in that emerging speculative growth over time. And I think the reason for that is as markets have become more global, as goods and services have become more digital, um, it means companies can scale better, which is great. Um, and we've seen companies like Google and Meta and Amazon and Tesla you know, build these massive, very valuable businesses in what a pretty short period of time um, by historical standards. But what that means is that because there's the potential for such a huge payoff if you do well, all the ones that don't succeed also get priced uh, at a higher price than what they used to. Mm. Um, and so if we're kind of going back to that example of maybe you had a portfolio of 30 of these things and you know 29 are gonna 28 might fail, two, one might do pretty well and one might kind of knock the ball out of the park, all of them get priced up at the initial stage. Um, and so if you've only got two or three of them, you, you know, don't have a portfolio that can be diversified, you're going to lose twice as much on those because uh, that optionality, that chance mm. of mega success is being priced in much earlier, I think, than it used to. And even in public markets, we, we can see that if you look at companies like a Snapchat or a Twitter before it was acquired, I'm sure there's some examples in Australia. I mean, Snapchat was founded in 2011 um, and it's never made an annual profit. Um, it listed in 2017 around $17. It's currently around $10. And the entire time, people have been forecasting this inflection in margins up towards you know, Meta or Facebook like margins of 30, 40%. And they, they just haven't, <laughs> it hasn't occurred. You know, they, they still don't make any money but the asset is still priced like it's going to make money. Um, and so to invest in that, you've got to have not only conviction that the revenue growth will continue, you need to have conviction that they will expand margins and become a profitable business. And then even if both of those things happen, because that's what's being priced in, um, your return still may not be very good. So it just makes it quite difficult um, to, to have conviction in those sorts of investments. And the reason I said I think it's got harder is it's interesting if you compare that to Google and Meta, when they listed, they had, I think, 30 40% operating margins already. Yeah. They're already making a lot of money. And the, what you had to pay for that was, um, you know, if we think of it as a multiple of revenue, as you kind of alluded to before and some people value things on, it was a similar multiple of revenue to what you might have paid for Snap, but they were making 40% margins instead of no margins. Mm. Um, so it was a lot easier, um, whereas good point. Yeah. today I think it's a little bit more challenging to find those companies where the risk reward makes sense to us. How about then over the last few years, like we've seen in, since COVID or during COVID, we've seen sh shoot up of growth companies, right? Um, huge over the last few years. Um, how does that gel or drive with the way you invest in Magellan? Yeah, I think um, at times it was challenging because it felt it felt like you were missing out on something, or you know, yeah, you were missing the bigger picture, or maybe you weren't as optimistic as you should be. Again, Snapchat's a good example here, where it traded, you know, as I said, over the, the 2017 till today, it hasn't really moved um, from call it 10 to 20 dollars, but it went, I think, to 70 or 80 dollars mm. um, during during COVID. And so you've had something that's gone up 7x and uh, you know, outperformed Meta or, or Google um, significantly. And you, you, you ask yourself, oh, 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 did we miss something here? Um, and I think the subsequent drawdown is, you know, it was nice that we remained disciplined. We didn't kind of go down the quality spectrum and, and chase those speculative growth companies. And we've seen that as rates have normalized as and as equity risk premiums have uh, kind of normalized that it, it came all the way back down um, to earth and you see that with other companies i think you know there are some you know a company like spotify is probably at the edge of where we might be comfortable investing um, it's a business that we think should make money uh, it's a good industry structure leadership amongst three players 
um, high switching costs in my view. I don't think people are, are, are too likely to switch. Apple's always offering people the option to switch. They get three months if you buy a new device, but people kind of stick with their, their mm. Spotify. You've got other family members on there. You've got playlists on there. Um, but e- even that just got massively swung around by those equity risk premiums and um, discount rates and, and just investor optimism around what could be in the mm. future, whether that was the advertising side of their business or not. So it, it just makes it difficult to, to have conviction. I'd say one where we had more conviction that it would become quite profitable was Airbnb. Um, I think it listed in, in 2020. It hadn't made a lot of money historically, um, but we were very familiar with some of its competitors like Booking and Expedia.com. Both of those are very quite profitable, particularly booking, um, and they spend a lot of on advertising on Google to get to get your clicks if you go and search for a hotel. Airbnb doesn't advertise on Google, so it made sense to us that you know it should be able to, even though it's a bit higher touch model um, than hotels dealing with alternative accommodation providers, should be able to make a lot of money. Um, and so that's one where we had conviction that it would make a lot of money, but even so that was still being priced in, as I mm. kind of talked about earlier. So it's not, we didn't end up owning it, um, but it was closer because we could at least have the conviction um, that it should make a lot of money. Mm. Um, just we come to wrap up here, I, I'm, you've, you've come up with so many great examples to express the point, even that one just before with Snapchat and the, the multiples that are paid just because Facebook did you know, well and what have you. But maybe, Ryan, if you could leave us maybe with a couple of ideas that folks can put on their watch list. They can head to the Magellan website, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, uh, pick up the quarterly reports but also um, the fact sheets and those types of things. Uh, you guys also do some great podcasts and, and what have you. Um, but maybe if you just leave us with a couple of ideas that might illustrate the process and our folks can then follow the story along in their own time. Yeah, absolutely. So I might... Um, start with SAP, which is a, mm-hmm. a European software company. It provides ERP or enterprise resource planning software, plus a bunch of other types of software, mainly to large, um, very large businesses, also some mid-market businesses. And we think this is a really interesting uh, and attractive investment at the moment. And I spoke earlier about you know, the inflection in views of quality and growth about Adobe and, and this transition to uh, cloud or subscription software. And I, I think of SAP as similar to that, but probably 10 years later. And the reason it's 10 years later is because its software is much more complex. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been heavily customized by its customer base over time to, to fit their specific needs. And so transitioning customers to a more homogenous um, cloud software solution is taking a lot more time. Um, and it took a lot more time to get it ready to transition the customers as well. But over the past three, four, five years, they've, they've been building those cloud solutions. They've been integrating their various cloud assets that they've acquired. They've been investing in kind of a common data platform and, and efficiently using cloud infrastructure to deliver that service. Um, and they're starting to make traction, transitioning those customers from on-premise to cloud. Um, and when they make that transition, they generate around two times the revenue from their customers on the other side mm-hmm. um, is the average multiplier they get because they're, they're wrapping in more other solutions that are adjacent to that core ERP solution they're capturing more of the pass or some of the database market um, and stuff like that as they do it. And, and so that, trans- that, that transition has started to gain steam. They, they um, started this RISE program where they would help customers out and provide support because it's not just about, uh, you know, it's, I think we should differentiate it from something like Microsoft uh, Word where you just move from a license to, to a subscription. <laughs> <laughs> to be a bit cynical, there wasn't much change in the product. Um, when you're changing the ERP software, this is really a business process change. So it's not just those customizations that I talked about that are a challenge. It's that you're really needing to redesign your business process mm. at the same time. And so 
it's implemented these programs to help its customers make that transition. It actually went out and acquired some um, software implementation vendors and process change vendors to, to help them, give them that nudge. Um, and so we think that's going to drive a period of revenue acceleration and then sustained solid top line growth um, of around double digit top line growth for a long period of time. So it won't be as dramatic as some of these other software companies that can transition mm. quite quickly. Um, but we actually like that it's hard to transition because it means that it will take a long time to transition that customer base and, and just contribute to that outsized revenue growth for an extended period. And the other benefit from creating that more homogenous cloud product that's a bit more flexible, a bit easier to use, is they're attracting a lot of new customers at the same time. So the new product's called S4 HANA, and it's not just the transition. It's already growing quite strongly, but relatively small part of their revenue still. But a lot of the growth so far is coming from those new customers that find it much more approachable. It's a subscription, so you're not having to pay these significant upfront license costs. Um, and so there's that part. It's also very defensive. So there's a bit of a slowdown in IT spend at the moment, for example, but this isn't a software that's based on the number of seats. Um, it's very mission critical for businesses. So it's not something that you kind of turn down or turn off. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very resilient to, to economic conditions and customer switching is also very rare. So there's SAP and Oracle are the two main vendors of this uh, ERP software for large businesses. And occasionally a customer might switch between the two, but it's it's very rare just because it's such a big process um, for the companies. And so that gives them pricing power as well, which we which we really like over mm. time. And so if I link that back to you know, some of those examples we talked about of, of where you might find undervalued or attractively valued businesses, we think this is a business where that growth is going to surprise to the upside. Um, we think there's going to be outsized growth for you know, an extended period of time. And we also think there's going to be a positive re-rating in the quality of that business. Um, it, it was viewed, I guess, as a bit of a legacy software provider, a bit of a legacy stack of software, um, but they've really done a lot of work to modernise um, their software stack to, and, and, and we think once people see the customer's transition and they see that they're capturing that two times increase in revenue that I spoke about, um, that there will be a positive re-rating. They still trade at quite a lower multiple than, than some of the other software names out there, mm. for example. Mm. And, and an interesting lesson also for SAP is, is timing. I think perhaps this is one where um, you know, it, it did take a bit longer than we thought. We, we monitored it the whole way through. We were speaking to the company and there were frustrations at time that you know, we, we thought they were more progressed than they were going to be. Um, but, you know, I think management did a good job of continuing along that path and, and making at times difficult decisions to get them to where they are today. Um, but, you know, we've been in contact with them, you, you know, you, you mentioned process through this entire period, just trying to make sure is that 2x real, you know, how far along these harmonisation programs are you, what are these reference customers that you can show to other customers that have transitioned and, and you know, were they positive case studies? Um, so really trying to get conviction that that transition would occur um, mm. and what it would mean for the revenue growth of the business when it did occur. Mm. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to pick your brain on one other, if I may, mm -hmm. which is uh, the business of Intuit. Um, because I think a lot of people that watch this will be very familiar with the Australian names like Zero and NYOB. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about Intuit, which is probably the gorilla in the room? Um, can you talk a little bit about that, mate? Yeah, absolutely. So, so as you said, it's it's very similar to Zero uh, or in, in kind of Australia, New Zealand, or, or Sage from the from the UK. Um, but they have a near monopoly position uh, in the US in both tax filing software for individuals where there's not a kind of an ATO solution like there is here mm -hmm. um, and in accounting software for, for small businesses. And I, I think compared to some other types of software companies that are much more about the capabilities, there's a this is kind of branded software is how I think about it, where it's also, what's your brand awareness with small businesses? What's the familiarity? Um, you know, there's, there's stats around 
small business value is quite high, but it's often those same owners that go on to create a new business. So if they're familiar with that software, they tend to, to stick to it. Um, and so their, their strong position in the US, the branding has meant that even though Zero and Sage have had a crack at entering the US, their traction they've gained has been very limited. Um, so I think that just goes to the quality of, of Intuit's business um, in the US. In terms of why uh, we like it, we think there's some really attractive um, and diverse growth drivers that will continue for an extended period of time. If we think about the tax business, for example, they dominate um, kind of the, the online self-serving, you're doing it as an individual yourself. But that market is a bit smaller relative to people that have more complicated tax requirements. And what they've been able to do is come out with a live offering where they connect you um, with a tax expert. They use AI to interpret, you know, mm-hmm. read through all your documents, figure out where the key questions are going to be. And, and that market is much, much larger than its existing tax market. Um, and it's got a product there, TurboTax Live, that's really gaining significant traction in addressing that part of the market and supporting growth there. And then on the QuickBooks side, which is a small business accounting, um, it's it's moving up market with the product QuickBooks Advanced. It's got payments and payroll. Uh, you'd be amazed how many businesses in the US still use Check to make a lot of their payments. Yeah. They can offer payment solutions, clip the ticket on that. Um, and there's a really big AI unlock opportunity. So a lot of people, a lot of small businesses in the US still use Excel or they use pen and paper to do their books. Um, and the reason is it, it's still a bit overwhelming to try and use this software at times. It's not kind of what you're trying to do with your business and you kind of come in, you do it for a little bit, and then maybe you drop out, you kind of forget how to use it. Um, but they've rolled out co-pilots that will you know, make it a lot easier to, to use the product, to get value out of the product. And so they're going to get a lot better return on marketing their product to new customers. They'll hopefully get a lot better retention of the customers that they do get to trial their product. And so we think they're going to unlock a lot of that um, non-consumption addressable market that's always been there and they've been penetrating it slowly. But we think this is an opportunity for them to, to penetrate that more quickly um, mm-hmm. as well. I really like that um, that business case and the way you broke it down because people still aren't that familiar with the the US experience versus the Australian experience from a tax perspective or even that of the UK. Um, so those are two wonderful examples in uh, SAP and Intuit, mate. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in this discussion, but the easiest place for people to go is the Magellan website if they want to learn more. Um, you can check out all the portfolios on there as well. Um, but it was a real delight first meeting meeting with you and then hearing from you, mate. You clearly have absorbed so much wisdom from those around you, but also through the, the boots on the ground research yourself. So, um, yeah, thank you on behalf of everyone that uh, listens to the podcast and everyone attending the Virtual Investor Summit. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.